Hi, everyone, and welcome to the ACSM Greater New York Regional Chapter Podcast. I'm your host, James Jankowitz, and today we have joining us Amanda Fazio. And Amanda is received her master's degree uh, in sports psychology and motor behavior from the University of Tennessee and is a certified mental performance consultant, CMPC, through the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. Her passion lies with empowering athletes and performers to reach their highest potential both on and off the field uh, through the teaching of evidence-based mental techniques, specifically surrounding positive psychology and a mindfulness approach in utilizing techniques from motivational interviewing, which you know, I hope to talk about. It is her goal for performers to not solely use mental techniques and increase enjoyment in performance, but to find it in everyday life. Um, Fa's experience has ranged from working with has ranged from working with athletes recovering from injury, overcoming performance anxiety, and training coaches at the collegiate to professional level in motivational interviewing. So Amanda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, James. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And you will be speaking at the upcoming conference on April 22nd, which is only two weeks away. And uh, so let's get into a little bit of your background. You are sure. a sports psychologist. Uh, talk us through that. What got you into the field? Why did it um, excite you? And what do you actually do in your practice from day to day? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think it's something that oftentimes, um, you know, there's many ways to go about it. And um, But really, I mean, I, I was an athlete my whole life. I was a, a softball player growing up, um, ended up uh, playing college softball at the Division One level. Um, and after that, I really got into actually college softball coaching. Um, I was at a Division Three school, um, then jumped over to a Division One school before um, being over at the University of Tennessee. So I was really fortunate um, to be able to work with Billy Wallace down there. Um, while also be working towards my master's in sports psychology and motor behavior. Um, and so I initially did that because I was I was coaching, obviously, all the physical skills and was loving, um, you know, being a college coach um, and developing people physically. But I, I just started to notice kind of a lack of ability to really be able to help the student athletes mentally. Um, you know, I, I could connect with them. I could um, understand things in their life, but there was just a certain level of really a lack of support on that end um, when it came to being able to help athletes mentally on the field. And as we know, a lot of uh, sports are, you know, 90% mental, as a lot of people say. Um, and so I really, you know, started to see a shift when I went for that master's program at UT um, to wanting to be able to, you know, I was like, wait a minute, I can do this. Um, as well and still work with athletes, but be really focused on the mental side of what we do. And so um, that's really what got me jump started into um, sports psychology and the field as a whole. Um, and so right now I, I'm at Sports Strata, which is a private mental health practice um, and performance coaching practice out of New York City. Um, and really our team focuses on working with athletes of all levels. Um, we also work with performers, so actors, dancers. We work with the New York City Ballet. Um, we work with executives, um, really on all of the mental side of what they do. So our, our main focus is um, being able to use uh, specific techniques um, and really understand the research and science behind uh, performance. Um, and behind a lot of even, you know, uh, neuropsych and, and things on that level, um, to help people level up, we call it, um, to kind of get that 1% better. Um, so we offer on both sides, whether it be counseling and more of the mental health side and being able to understand what an athlete's going through, or whether it be, you know, even just being able to deal with performance anxiety or things that are really specific to on the field, on the court, um, on stage, things like that. So it really spans into a lot of different areas, um, which, yeah. which certainly I love doing. <clears throat> that That's great. And it's so great to see that the industry itself is emerging, right? Like um, mm -hmm. you can speak to it more than I can, but you've probably seen the, the fact that the ballet company, you know, in addition to all the athletes are really embracing this whole end of it, you know, because it's been such an important part. And, you know, as an athlete, 
growing up through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was pretty dismissed. And I was a marathoner, you know, and it, it's fine when you're in your 20s and you're getting through it. But you know, when you're doing, putting that kind of mileage in, in your 30s, the, the, the psychological part really starts to uh, weigh in. You know, you really want to explore those strategies to, you know, to, to, to perform better. Yeah, I mean, you get to the point um, where, you know, whether you're playing a sport in college or running marathons or performing on stage or even in the boardroom, things like that, where everybody kind of has a certain level of physical technique, right? Everybody's going to have a certain level of um, critical thinking and um, skill on that side. But really what's going to start to separate people apart is how do I regulate myself emotionally? How Mm. do I you know, kind of handle pressure mentally. Um, and, you know, I'm, while certainly we, we never like to, to see athletes go through these kind of mental performance struggles, um, a lot of athletes, even Simone Biles, just a few years back in the Olympics, um, with a lot of what came out with the twisties, um, MLB baseball too, and um, the NBA have been big proponents of, um, of mental performance as well as the U.S. Army has been doing it for years and years and years and so um, it's pretty cool to see that come through and almost see athletes and families in general um, performers as a whole see that wait a minute this is something that I should have access to um, and I do and it's something that I can you know have as a part of my arsenal to really help me um, help me improve. Yes, absolutely. So Amanda, you mentioned two terms, uh, mental performance uh, Mm -hmm. coaching and mental health counseling. Uh, Mm -hmm. Can you parse those for us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So this is a big one that comes up a lot, whether I'm talking to students or um, even just talking to families and and individual clients. Um, Yeah, so coaching um, as a whole, right? We have really the physical side of coaching. So whether it's teaching somebody how to enhance fielding a ground ball or um, more situational skills um, when it comes to that level, Um, more of the tactical, we call it, right? That's all gonna fall under um, coaching, right? And then on the kind of mental side, we have um, two different, really two different factors, right? One is going to be mental performance um, and we call it mental performance coaching. Um, And a lot of that are all of the mental skills that go into performance enhancement. So that's when we're talking about motivation, um, even certain levels of performance anxiety that might be happening or showing up specifically in the sports space. Um, It could be things we're talking about with emotional regulation, right? Everything really specific to when I'm on the field, when I'm on stage, those are, that's all going to fall under mental performance coaching, um, which actually as a student really just involves a master's degree um, in, in sports psychology um, or some level of what we call applied sports psychology. Um, and then a slightly different degree, um, you know, the mental health counseling piece is more so when we're talking about a clinical work. Um, and by that, we mean some of our performers that might be challenged by depression, anxiety, um, situational depression, um, certain anxiety disorders, right? All of that um, is going to kind of span outside of the area of performance. Um, And that involves a little bit more of um, a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling um, or social work. So it is a little bit different um, when it comes to, you know, just the training as a whole, certainly, you know, I like to think of it as um, an area of abundance, right? We need people on both sides. Um, but a lot of times if you have your master's in on the clinical side um, and you're ultimately a clinical mental health counselor who specializes in performance, um, there are programs out there that offer both um, and kind of do a little training on that end, um, which is pretty cool to see because then you can not only help athletes on the mental side, on the field. But let's say something comes up like an injury, like something um, that's a little bit more inhibiting and it starts to affect them in other areas of life and really be debilitating in other areas, maybe affecting social life, school, things like that. That's when we really start to look at it as a clinical need as well. Um, And certainly, you know, we're humans before we're ever athletes or performers. And so that's really where for me, I see the overlap um, in the biggest way is being able to actually work with the human 
right, um, and see the human side, um, which sometimes might involve a clinical piece. Um, and so it's cool to be able to do both, but it's also, you know, certainly um, the MLB and, and other um, professional sports um, actually have people on both sides. So more of a clinical side, and then they have also mental performance coaches um, on, on the applied side. So dovetailing off of that, uh, mm -hmm. nobody likes to get injured, no matter who they are. But if you're an athlete or a performer, it's particularly exacerbating. So what are some of the signs of psychological stress uh, in an athlete who's been injured? And is there a spectrum? Does it run from low to yeah. high? I mean, everybody gets in the doldrums if they have an injury, but like, what are, what are some of the more clinical signs you would look for? Yeah, so I mean, certainly nobody likes <laughs> nobody likes to be injured. I haven't met one yet um, that really enjoys the injury process. Um, but yeah, no. Overall, I mean, when we're talking about athletes or performers, um, when it comes to injury, some of the biggest signs that we see um, it's really a lot of grief in a lot of ways, right? Because it's a loss of something. It's a loss of certain levels of social belonging, maybe. It's a loss of just physical ability in some sense. And so we might see a decrease in self-esteem. Um, we might see, you know, even low levels of signs of depression, um, withdrawing, um, kind of have, feeling like an identity loss. A lot of times as athletes and performers, we get wrapped up in our identity and a lot of our confidence and connection comes from you know, what we do as performers. Um, and so it can be hard to separate that and really see value in yourself, right? As a individual, when you can't do the thing that one, you love doing, but two, you're really good at doing, right? So certain levels of anxiety even might come up um, when it comes to returning to play, right? Or what my future might look like um, and kind of a, a decrease in self-efficacy um, I would say one of the main signs in terms of it kind of shifting from the, the more performance space to the clinical space is a, a loss of that social system, right? Withdrawing from family, friends, um, you know, even just kind of really feeling the low um, of what you're experiencing for more than um, multiple times a week um, or multiple days in a row, kind of that feeling you can't shake, right? It kind of goes beyond the situational. And when it starts to affect our motivation in school, um, our connections with friends, family, teammates, that's when we really start to, you know, really hit a pause button and go, wait a minute, there's a lot more going on here. Um, and it's something that certainly we can we can address and, and help with and help somebody cope with. I can't take away the injury um, or magically give somebody a pill to make them better, um, but certainly we can help them really dig into a lot of that stuff I just mentioned and, and kind of see it from a different approach. I see. So then can you briefly walk us through that injury process, that, not the injury itself, but the psychological process? Um, mm -hmm. Are there basic steps? Like if, if you are, you know, a mate or a friend, a family member to an athlete who might've gotten injured, like what, what are we looking for? And, you know, how do we know when it's maybe time to punt it to a more professional person? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question um, because a lot of us are, are naturally want to be helpers, right? We want to be able to help somebody through an injury. Um, but if you've never experienced one, or if you're somebody too, that maybe you would experience an injury in a completely different way, um, you know, and you have a, a teammate or a loved one that might've had a, a season ending or even career ending injury. Um, what we really start to look at is what we talk about is, is our pillars of self-worth, um, right? So our pillars of self-worth are really going to revolve around um, you know, what are the things that really hold us up um, as individuals, right? So that might be things um, like we consider living consciously, right? Self-acceptance, um, being able to assert myself, to find purpose in life, right? So it is kind of these very broad categories. Um, but as a, a teammate, right, I might be looking for signs of um, a real shift in any of those areas. Right. So maybe the person is really, really fixated on what's going on emotionally for them. Right. They just seem constantly down. Um, they might be 
kind of talking in, in more negative ways. Um, maybe they really are having a hard time, um, you know, socially. Maybe they're not really hanging out with teammates as much, not feeling connected, um, or kind of starting to show signs of, of pulling away. Um, and then there's this other part of living purposefully where we really start to see um, maybe somebody is, you know, not showing up to classes anymore if they're a college athlete or a performer on that end. Um, there's a sense of like kind of hopelessness or helplessness in the way they're describing things, right? This, this is never going to end. I'm never going to get through this. I can't believe this happened. There's certainly a certain level of that up front when somebody first experiences an injury. But once we start seeing that go for two, three, four weeks, that's when we're really starting to to say, wait a minute, I, I can't necessarily understand this. And I'm trying to show empathy for this person um, and help them through it because they're my friend or they're my teammate. Um, but also, you know, there's somebody here that's a resource that can help them through that as well mm-hmm. and can understand it from a different perspective. And that's really... Um, what I talk to a lot of teams about is you don't have to hold this person up alone, right? They certainly need your support. Um, but a lot of our, our athletes, um, when we work with athletic trainers at, at colleges too, um, you know, some, for some teams, it's mandatory that if there's an injury that keeps them out for more than a week, that they're seeing us, right? At least three times. Um, and so certainly, you know, I'll never say that you have to, um, but that is something that we've explored too, just because sometimes we've, you know, an athlete might not even come in contact with us because they might not truly understand the benefit of what we can provide until something like this kind of rocks their world. So it's a big piece of that too, looking for not just somebody getting stuck in the sports space and being really fixated on that, but starting to see it affect them outside of that sports space as well. I see. I see. Have you ever heard of the book Way of the Peaceful Warrior, by the way? I haven't, actually, which is a surprising one. Usually I'm, I'm on top of it. You're on top of the book. That, yeah. No, it's, I would highly recommend it to anybody listening to. It's it's the, um, the autobiography of Dan Millman, who was a world champion gymnast, who, before going to an event, smashed his leg in a motorcycle accident. And it was about his recovery process, which became sort of like a spiritual journey, you know, back to himself. But it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very inspirational read. If an athlete is in this particular predicament, it's, it's one of those books that just, you read every page, just feel a little better, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So it's uh, definitely worth checking out. So that, to that end, let's talk about now, they experienced an injury. The bodies failed them on some level. How did they start gluing that relationship between um, their mind and their body back together to start working synergistically. Is there uh, an obstruction in that in the healing process? Uh, Is it more difficult as you're older versus younger? Just talk a little bit about how you pair the mind body together again after after an injury, especially one that's taken you out for a long time and has indeed caused psychological duress. Yeah. um, And so you know, it's a, it's a great point, and I think too, just to add to what you were saying with the with the book, right? I, I think really what that gets at is one: no two injuries are the same, right? I can have two athletes that both tore an ACL, um, and they might be experiencing different things. Um, there might be some similarities across the board, but that also brings in like just creating connection, right? Being able to have somebody that understands what they're going through um, is sometimes really helpful as well to be able to say like, I see myself in that person or that person got through it. And that's exactly what I'm feeling and experiencing. So I really value that um, first off. But um, second, yeah, when it comes to being able to just kind of understand that mind-body connection, we know as as athletes and really, um, you know, why why I have a career in this example, um, that our everything kind of starts with our minds, right? Whether it's walking, um, which we don't even really think about anymore as as consciously, but there is a level of brain activity that's happening, right? All the way up to being able to perform um, on the field. And so what we're really looking at um, when it comes to the psychology of injury is what we call our stress response, 
right? So everybody has a different degree of stress response, right? So that might come into play with um, maybe my history of stressors. Have I been injured in the past? Um, have things come up that have stressed me out a lot? It's a big deal in sport in the past. My personality, right? Um, how am I different from individuals? Um, what maybe my demographic is? Um, if I have a certain level of coping resources, am I somebody that kind of possesses a certain level of emotional regulation already? Um, hmm. And maybe I have some interventions that have worked well in the past, right? So we're starting to look at things um, with how I respond to stress, right? There, There is going to be a certain level of stress, and we all have coping mechanisms within us to handle that stress. But it's kind of like a muscle, right? Like I, I don't just do 10 bicep curls and look at my bicep and see it get much bigger, right? It's more so how can we strengthen that muscle in our mind to be able to cope, right? And so a lot of times the response to sport injury and the rehab process, no matter what the age of the individual is, we have to step back and look at it as a whole. Right, we have to step back and look at those kind of different categories that I just mentioned before and really get into what we call cognitive appraisal, which certainly is something we'll talk more about um, on that panel. But really, how am I appraising? How am I recognizing um, and understanding the stress I'm experiencing? Right, because if I immediately go to, well, this is terrible. I'm never going to play. I'm never going to be able to play again. I'm never going to play the same, right? This injury is something that, that will never leave me, right? If I go, if I praise the injury in that way, I give it that power, um, I'm going to heal differently, right? I'm going to be, I'm going to experience the recovery process differently as opposed to, okay, some of those things might be on our minds. That might be how we're responding with thoughts and feelings, but that doesn't have to be the narrative I'm writing here, right? It could just be something I recognize and then shift to, okay, how do I then take that thought? How do I take those feelings and how do I become a little bit more mentally flexible, right? To see the other side of it as well. How do I appraise this injury differently? Um, and that's really what we're getting into a lot of times when I work with athletes, whether it be, um, you know, a high school athlete or whether it be somebody even past college, right? Is, is, it doesn't really discriminate, right? Injuries don't discriminate between um, somebody who's younger versus somebody who's older. But the reason why we look at multiple different factors in the person's life, we look at them as a whole person, um, it's because there might be areas they're already really strong in. And we can use that to our advantage in recovery. Um, but then on the other side, there might be coping mechanisms that they just don't have yet. And that doesn't mean we're never going to have them. It just means we have to strengthen that muscle a little bit more. Um, so it, it, you start to see, you know, the way we can connect the mind and the body in that way um, to really, a lot of times I'm talking to athletic trainers, right? And, and really trying to collaborate with them about somebody's progress and what that looks like, how we can both support them on that end of both the mental and the physical side, um, because it's not just one thing. Right. One, it's not just an athlete. We're looking at an individual as a whole. Right. And you have that whole mind body connection, which is fascinating. I, I have a background in philosophy, so that's something that I've just always found a fascinating study. Greeks were like, yeah, it's all connected. Middle Ages came along. Descartes like, no, it's not. <laughs> Other religions yeah. came along and say, no, it's connected. You know, we, we this is something we've been battling out for thousands of years, you know, but I, I personally am a firm believer that they are you know, inextricably linked and they are one unit and you really need to work on them as one for sure. And I think that's, that, that seems to be the, the common consensus. Is that correct in your field these days? Yeah. And I think what you're getting at there, James, is like we all have as humans, a negative bias, right? Like it's just sure. the way yeah. we evolve and it's the way like, and, and, you know, we can get into, um, like even on the neurological side to me is, is so fascinating the way, um, you know, our body responds to stress. Um, but even more so on, on the side of we just have a, a negative bias and sometimes that lens is is telling us things that might not be true, right? Mm -hmm. But it's okay to recognize, hey, like this is just my initial reaction. This is just my initial emotional response, my initial thought around it. 
doesn't mean that has to be the way I'm going to behave or that way, the way that this is going to go. Right. And a lot of times, like that's a big piece of, of acceptance around the injury and kind of that's where I start to bring in co- different concepts of grief um, and stages of grief um, because it's not exactly the same, but it is in some ways just in terms of cultivating acceptance um and moving through those stages denial things like that um because we are already predispositioned towards pointing seeing the negative um and that's okay that doesn't mean we can't heal or we can't um you know get better at uh that strengthening that mind body connection when it comes to recovery right got you so last question and this is kind of an important one. It'll be interesting to see what your take is on this. So again, we're family members. We're not terribly skilled in this. We're friends. We're trying to be a support system. In what ways can we support them through psychologically through an injury without repeating, you know, pop psychology tropes they've heard a hundred times, you know, like, oh, it'll be better. Just hang in there. You know, it's like, is, is there a different yeah. path we could take? Is there a different strategy we can do that might be a little more informed? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is really where I start to bring in um, different concepts revolving around motivational interviewing, which is really a communication style about understanding um, another uh, another person's motivation to change. It comes from a lot of change research, addiction research originally. Um, but you don't even have to be an, an expert in motivational interviewing to kind of see how it can be impactful, right? I always joke with athletes and, and they always get a good laugh out of um, you know, when a coach just yells like focus, right. Or throw strikes. It's like, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Right. So if I go up to an athlete <laughs> exactly. who's injured and I'm just like, Hey, don't worry about it. You're going to come back stronger. If you've ever been injured, I mean, you appreciate your teammates, um, and loved ones saying those things. And certainly there's a time and place for it. I'm not saying that'll, that it's a bad response, but you're like, yeah, okay. But this is how I'm feeling right now. Like I, yeah. I, I, that's helpful. I, I do know I'm going to come back, but right now this really, really sucks. Right. And that's a big part of, of my role. Um, and our role as, um, performance coaches is we always say sitting with somebody in the way that nobody else in their life does. Right. So that's just empowering in, its, in itself to have that connection with somebody, but on the side of what can I do, right. If I'm a friend or a teammate, a lot of times a big tenant of motivational interviewing is asking open-ended questions, right? And that's a big way that we can show that we care about somebody and we can show and demonstrate empathy that I'm really listening and hearing them, right? So for example, an open-ended question around um, if I'm a teammate and, you know, another one of my teammates is injured and they've been really down, right? Like I could easily, a lot of times people go, hey, let me know if you mean anything. And that other person might go, okay, yeah, thanks. And then never ask again, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but a big way we can even demonstrate empathy is just by saying like, hey, what's kind of been the hardest part of this for you so far? Or, hey, I noticed that, you know, you didn't come to team movie night or you didn't come out to dinner. Like, um, is there anything we can do that might be, you know, better for you right now? Or, um, you know, what what would it look like, right, to kind of ex- kind of get out there more with the team, right? Those questions are different than just the yes or no question. Those questions are throwing it to the other person to tell me what they need, right? But also help me understand what they're going through, right? Mm-hmm. It's a it's. It comes up a lot now in communication, just being able to understand somebody. We all know when somebody is not really listening or on a a personal agenda, right? But being able to say, I don't have an agenda here, except for getting to understand what you're going through better. That's a huge skill um, that anybody can do. And so I really encourage athletes, parents, um, support systems to utilize those open-ended questions. Um, because at the end of the day, like you're giving that person a space to talk about themselves and talk about what they're experiencing, which for a lot of people is really so freeing, right? To that extent, being able to say something, um, that's on their mind and they'll tell you, right? The, the, that person will tell you what they need, 
um, if you give them the chance to, um, and if you continuously ask those open-ended questions that you don't know the answers to. Um, that really is what strengthens connection in a lot of ways. There's a really big first step and goes beyond just, hey, how's it going? Hey, are you okay? Right. right. The last time I asked somebody, hey, are you okay? I rarely get no's. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it, it's more so how can I ask that question in a different way? Um, you know, what, what, what can I do for you right now? What do you need from me as a teammate? Right. It, it's more so those types of questions that really can help somebody feel supported and heard um, who might be dealing with something like an injury. That's great advice. I really, really appreciate that. And I look forward to hearing you speak more about it <clears throat> on the panel discussion on our conference, which is coming up. Yeah. Uh, let me just announce that real quick. Uh, 2023 uh, ECSM New York Regional Chapter Conference, uh, our spring meeting, it's called Organized Sports in Crisis, Mental Health Outcomes from Athletic Participation. It's on Saturday, April 22nd, 2023. So we're just two weeks away. Um, it's going to be an in-person event. You'll have on-demand access to the content May 5th through the 31st, and it'll be held, and all this information is up on the screen, it'll be held at NYU Langone Medical Center Science Building, 551st Ave, New York, New York. So, Amanda, we look very much forward to hearing you speak there as well, and do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? No, I mean, I, I really appreciate it, James. Um, really excited to be at the conference. I'll have two of my colleagues there as well. Um, and so hoping to give various perspectives um, and hope that people can can come with an open mind, but also questions, fire, fire them at us. Um, you know, this is such a, a topic that I think we all experience at some point when it comes to rehab injury. Um, it's rare that somebody doesn't go through that. And so I think there's only a a beginner's mind that we can take to it and, and really expand our brain. So I'm excited certainly to to hear from my colleagues, but also others um, at the conference. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it too. So I'll see you there and thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much. And I will talk to you soon, James. <laughs>